everyone. Um, awesome, we've got a bunch of people here. Good. You should all be able to be on video and unmute yourselves. But give me a minute to kick things off here, and then I'll open it up. Those of you who've been here before know I like to do a little introduction at the beginning. Um, so I'll start with that. <clears throat> Welcome to the Suffolk Legal Innovation and Technology Lab's first Wednesday workshops for the Document Assembly Line community. These are a chance to dive deeper into topics related to building guided interviews with DocAssemble using the Document Assembly Line tools. Today's topic is interview project management, and our experts are everyone here. So when you speak for the first time, please introduce yourself with a sentence or two so we know who you are, um, where you're coming to interview building from, that kind of thing. This workshop is being recorded and we will share it on our YouTube channel. To find it, just check our blog on suffolklitlab.org or search for Suffolk Lit Lab on YouTube. This time, mics and video are enabled so we can have a conversation. One thing before we dive in, if you're hearing about the Lit Lab or the document assembly line for the first time, head over to suffolklitlab.org to learn more. Everyone who uses DocAssemble and the document assembly line tools is welcome to attend our weekly community meetings, join our community forum on Microsoft Teams and attend these workshops. If you wanna join us, just email us at litlab at suffolk.edu. Okay, let's get started. So as I said, um, for those of you who got the introduction um, one way or another, I would like to learn from those of you who build interviews, how you go about managing your interview building projects. Um, I have been working as on some of you know, as some of you know, I've been working on the uh, assembly line documentation. Um, and one of the pages I just launched, I just threw in the chat is a link to the interview building roadmap. Uh, and this is based on my experience building interviews with our summer students, as well as years of various ty types of projects. Um, but I'd love to know from you guys, how do you manage them? And feel free to um, chime in about any aspect of it. But I guess my first question is around kind of what does your team look like? What kinds of, do you have like a designated decision maker? Um, what, is, what do subject matter experts look like? Is it you pull in courts, coworkers, um, actual users and do you have is it just you building interviews or do you have a team of people how do you work together that kind of stuff that's the first thing i'm kind of interested in talking about anybody want to chime up i i see i see who's here and i know lots of you have lots of experience with this and so um i don't want to put anybody on the spot who doesn't want to talk but like matt emily i'd love to caroline i'd love to hear from you guys on how this works in your organizations I could uh, say a little bit about um, what we do. I, my name is uh, Emily Kressmiller. I'm a, a staff attorney at Michigan Legal Help um, and now spending most of my time working on doc assemble interviews. Yeah. Um, our team, it's, so it's, you know, me doing this with a, a big chunk of my time. Um, and then um, we have... Uh, content attorneys at Michigan Legal Help who are in charge of different subject areas. So they're kind of like our first line um, subject matter experts. And then they have um, hopefully yeah, uh, uh, sort of networks and connections on a lot of topics um, th so they can draw more broadly on um, practicing experts. Um I know, I know that Michigan, also, you guys are pretty tightly um, partnered with the courts, at least in some ways. And so I'm wondering, like, to what extent does that also spill over and involve court staff or judges or? Um, some of those contacts are um, folks with the court or um, some of those sort of like the staff attorneys contacts on different subject matter areas or on um how things work or sort of like questions that we might have about how forms are um, supposed to be filled out or how how things we do might affect the courts. Um, so I, I would guess I would say it's, it, we, it's sort of not directly like they're part of our process, but we might be reaching out to um, court staff 
and judges sometimes with questions. Who decides like what you're doing next? What interview you're going to work on next? Um, well, right now we're in the process of like transitioning a lot of our existing interviews to Doc Assemble. And so that in that process, we're kind of looking at usage numbers and trying to get some of our, I mean, part, you know, it's, because it's new, part of it was doing some like more reasonable size interviews to start with to get some more practice. And then, but also um, wanting to prioritize some of the heaviest use interviews. Um, in terms of like a new interview, um, you know, ideas will come up often when there's a change in the law that we are expecting would affect a lot of people um, or sometimes, you know, from part, sometimes we hear from partners that there's something that would be really useful. Um, it's something we haven't, um, you know, we, we've talked about needing to come up with a little bit of a more formal way to evaluate um, between the, all the different things you could work on. I think we all have <laughs> that kind of, we wish we had a better measuring stick or something like that. Um, so I, it sounds like you you do the building and then you kind of seek feedback from your stakeholders when you need it. And, um, and it's a little bit organic maybe. Yeah, so far I would say. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're I, again, we're just kind of starting to develop this um you know but previously we had a we were a, had a contractor who was doing most of our um maintaining of our oh, interviews right. so this is a little bit different now um the way we're doing things so we're also just still setting up systems gotcha caroline are you i i'm i'm guessing alaska is probably different in some important ways since you're working within the court system um and i don't know if that means you're a smaller team or a bigger team? Um, well, you know, I started doing Doc Assemble with Mass Legal Help with legal aid programs. Um, mm -hmm. And I made the decisions. It was me. Um, but we also, I worked very closely with a fam our family law domestic violence editor. So he, I made the decisions based on the um, numbers of people at the, who came to the website. And also we had a pretty good relationship with one of the senior attorneys at the, at the trial court, at the probate and family court. So together we made the decisions, but we, you know, it was pretty much me who was a decision maker. And then with our first interviews, we had a, a small team, but a good team. And we had a grant, um, and we had two substantive law attorneys, but su yeah, substantive attorneys, and and I was a developer, um, and then we had a project manager because we got a grant for it. For, well, we didn't, but the legal services, a different legal services program did. And so then you had a pretty well defined team there. We had a very good team, and we had a pretty good structure in terms of meeting weekly. Um, so that that was, I mean, that was our forums building team, which we would have moved to Doc Assemble if I had stayed there. Um, gotcha. And then the pandemic, and then I worked with, um, you know, the assembly line team during the pandemic um, on the 209, on the uh, domestic violence protective order, which was sort of 12 years in the making, given a lot of the input that we'd already had from previous uh versions of it um in a to j author so and docs and um hot dogs so i sort of feel like that was and that was huge but we did have um a dedicated substantive editor for for the family law forms on assembly line and we also had a lot of um interested we had domestic violence providers to review Oh, the, and the other thing is we also had, at one point, we had a really good liaison in the court who reviewed it and took, showed it to some judges. The decision makers changed in the, over the life of the interview, which we had to change. Mm -hmm. but that That's how it started in legal aids. But then I came here to the courts. And again, it was not form filling, but um, action plans. So basically a list of things to do in these family law cases. 
And so th those were an A to J author and I'm converting them to doc assemble. So that stuff is already, the questions and answers are already written. Um, I'm doing a little bit of plain language editing, not as, but, but again, we're under a time crunch. And You're basically I, just converting from one to another. Converting from one to another and improving where possible um, because the uh, because the technology has has improved and progressed. So we're doing. Who, that. who decides I, what you like? What order you work on? I have a list that I when I arrived in Alaska. Here's the list, and and they're all all of the interviews are integrated. So essentially I decide the order in which I'll approach the list because so for example, responding in a custody case and responding in a divorce case, they're both answers. There's a lot of overlap. So I work on those together, you know, we start, because we're not making one live before all the others. So they all have to go live together because they're all referring to each other. So mm -hmm. I pick them in terms of that would be organic in terms of how they flow together and work together and how, you know, the work, the workflow and the thinking and the logic behind all of that. Um, and uh, my boss reviews, review, is, she's a substantive expert. She's a family lawyer and um, she reviews the questions and the, you know, the answers and that kind of thing. And then we have, the court has um, a family law self-help center helpline and once we get to a certain point with each interview, then we run it by the facilitators there. So they're the people who answer um, questions from the public about what to do. Mm. And they okay. have a lot of input as well. We don't, most of what they talk about is um, language, um, but uh, at least we do have some review from them. Uh, yeah, so I think that's, that that answers your that's your that covers your I think so. Yeah. Emily popped in the chat to say she also has a data specialist and other staff who help with testing. Um, but you, you Caroline, Emily, and Michigan are kind of like a one person interview building team. I mean, there's there's lots of other people, but like you're actually doing the coding yourself. Vivian or Matt, I'm curious because I know you guys work together. How do you I divide wanna, responsibilities? I, I just want to say we're built. Actually, I forgot. I shouldn't have forgotten, but. I have forgotten that we also have a forms attorney and a technician hmm. and we're, I'm working on building a team with them. So I totally oh, cool. forgot about that. That's not fair to <laughs> I do it all myself. <laughs> Don't share the link to the video. <laughs> Vivian or Matt, can you weigh in on how you divide up responsibilities between the two of you? Yeah. If so you're willing. I can jump in if you don't mind, Matt. Um, sort of a, Central thing of our approach has been that usually in individual programs, one of us um, takes on the main onus of development and then the other will review, test or provide feedback to the other one. So it is a little bit on a case by case basis and we try and have some consistency in how we approach programs that has been you know, a little bit of experimentation and trial and error. There are definitely times where I find myself doing things in absurd ways. And Matt asks, why didn't you just do it like this other program had <laughs> it? And then I'll have to respond, I, I don't know why. <laughs> um, maybe, I feel like you guys have a pretty well-developed, um, maybe, uh, workflow. I'm curious too, like when you start a, when you start a new interview project or program, um, do you have like a, a kickoff meeting, I guess, for lack of a better word, like a ritual or a system for how you checklist for what you try to do at a, at a, at a start kickoff meeting? Either of you, well, I guess. Well, I'd say the, the thing that I tend to do is I will usually build, write out part of a roadmap and a spreadsheet before I start on too much development. Um, mm -hmm. But since we've been focusing on the migration project, it has that has helped it be a little more streamlined where we have reference points for what this specific program should be like, as well as you know, previous stock assemble programs to build off of. Um, so 
my approach generally has been to try and plan out a spreadsheet where I'll keep track of the variables that I'll need for the form templates, the conditions, any notes about each of those variables. Um, and then I'll start pulling things from other doc assemble programs, tweaking them, writing new questions. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if I have, we, we will discuss who's taking on what projects and discuss it, but I don't know that we have a formal ritual mm. in that sense. I suppose when I was putting together my materials, I was working with a present memory of our summer where we are, the students that I was working with were sort of an outside development team for the courts. Whereas for all, all three of you that have, that have spoken so far, you're sort of an internal development team, right? You're like, and I guess that was a little bit, that was a major distinction. And so when I put together our, the roadmap page, I was thinking of that where like, we're working with a client effectively, um, but the client rep, rep, the client is more metaphorical when you're an internal project team, I suppose. Yeah, um, I can, I can add a little yeah. bit more about our um, history and how we make some of the decisions. Um, when I started at Aleo, there was we were there was one automated documents producer, and I inherited a, a library of forms of automated forms. And so part of the work was keeping those up to date as those forms have been updated or the law changes. But then also when new forms are developed by our uh, by our courts or if stakeholders or end users approach us and say, hey, we want this form, um, then we would look at that and say, oh, should we automate that? So then we decide, okay, then we need to build that uh, from scratch. Um, and we can get into the specifics of how we do that as well. But we don't, we didn't typically have a big kickoff for any of these um, specific individual forms and things like that. You, we do sometimes have kickoffs for new grants and things, and the, but that'll, because that'll fund a bunch of different work, things that are part of our website, as well as maybe a few easy form uh, updates and things mm. like that. So we just, get in on that party to, for the, the kickoff celebration. Um, but we don't really have a, a ritual or anything we need to do to start things off. But as Vivian was saying, we do have a pretty well-defined process now about how we take something from, we wanna make this easy form to a completed program that's in, uh, in production. Um, so well, we can go into uh, all that, but we do work with oh. a variety of uh, stakeholders. So like legal aid partners, um, other community organizations, end users, our court partners, and all of those, as well as the funding that we can obtain, all factor into our prioritization and which ones we work on next. Also, if there's a, a law change, like when uh, uh, e-filing became uh, mandatory in, in Illinois, mm -hmm. um, then we had to stop new development to just make sure all of our existing programs could produce separate PDF uh, outputs if they're making court forms. So we do things like that. Or then when A to J author switched from version four to version six, we had to make sure everything was compliant there. And now we're moving everything to doc assembles. So now we're going through systematically and moving things over um, and trying to weave in like, oh, there's a new form that's developed. Let's just build it in doc assemble rather than build it here and stuff like that. And we've also mm -hmm. for a long time worked with uh, external contractors uh, as well to do some of the additional development work. And as you know, the close partnership with uh, the Suffolk assembly line community for help in doing all this work. Cause there are many times when Vivian and I together can't figure things out. So we reach out to all of you sure. also to the um, doc assemble community on Slack. It sounds like you guys have a pretty well-defined you mentioned a couple times so i'm assuming you've got a pretty well-defined like a roadmap or a workflow that you use to start get from start to end and i'm guessing uh, i'm guessing emily and caroline and others probably do have something like that too i'm curious what like what is that maybe maybe an overview like what's the what's what does that look like 
Um, Anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I have, um, what I think is how I have it up is I focus on the columns. So my first column is just, I have a section column, which I don't usually fill out right away, but that's my leftmost column. And then I have a variable column. Um, and so I fill out the variable, that's the column I'll go out and fill out first. I'll keep track of, I'll look at all the variables that I need, um, keep ones that are either together in the um, LHI version of the interview or ones that, if there's not an LHI interview, ones that are related or similar. So I'll, I mean, we'll, is, that, is that like a grocery list of all the variables that you use in your Illinois, in your easy forms? So is that what that, that, so you already have an existing list of variables and then you just kick, you just delete the ones that you're not going to be using in this, in this interview? Um, there are some that are very similar, that are reused, obviously, like the username variable is very often used. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so yeah, what I, I, I've set up a grocery list of variables, organize it by interview section. So keeping you, you know, information about the user together, if there's an opposing party, keep all that information together. And so once I have those variables listed out in a column and then sorted by section, um, I go through and I note, um, what conditions that variable will be needed under, and if there are any additional notes for logic. So I'm looking at um, one right now where I have a variable that is safe address, which is if someone wants to use, um, I actually think I might've changed this in the final version, but I have a safe address, which is only asked if the user wants to hide their own address. So it has a condition to appear just, which is just the if a draft of the if statement that I would use for that. So it is sort of, it is sort of as the, um, I sort of have the approach of from left to right in the spreadsheet, it becomes more detailed. So at first it's just the sections then it's the variables within the sections, then it's um, when those variables should appear, then it's notes about the block that generates a variable. Um, so if there's a variable that is generated by a code block, um, I'll have a, another column about the various blocks where I'll write down, write either just in, in, in English, I'll write down what the code needs to do, or I'll just write a quick dirty pass of the code itself. Um, so I, I, I don't know how well I'm, I feel like I'm not explaining my approach very well. It's just, no, I, um, I, but I'm curious too, like, do, do you, is there, do you have autonomy or do you like, like you get to decide things like, are we going to ask this before this, or how are we going to phrase this? Or do we need this information? Or at some point, do you take this to your stakeholders or to a decision maker? Um, to say, here's what I'm planning to do. What do you think? Um, or do you wait until you actually get to demo the interview? Or we we wait usually until we get to actually demo the interview. If there are any um, potential issues or ambiguities that we you know see just early on in the development process, we'll reach out to, um, namely either. Um, an expert in the legal subject or members of the committee that drafts the state forms for programs that use the Illinois state forms. But this is largely in a process of internal development. So I think the roadmap specifically, I haven't really shown to um, stakeholders. I've just shown them to Matt and a few other people in the, on the Aleo staff. Caroline, how, what's uh, or Emily or both, what or anyone else, what's uh, what's different or similar about how you manage the projects? Emily, you go. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go? You're already talking, Caroline. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. So, um, 
I think I do some something similar to the, well, I do a few things. Partly the questions and the answer, you know, this these steps that people take are already written from before. Um, so I am actually doing the I'm I can't what I don't know what recombining means, but basically I look at I have like 24 questions depending on the various paths that people t would take through the sorry, 24 answers. Same answer, like fill out these forms is it, a as an is a step in the action plan, but there's 24 of them because they're the final res they're one of the final results depending on the path that people take through the question. So I have to go through all of this all the permutations of the step and figure out what's similar and what's not similar. Um, so what I tend to do is I take that and then I also take the original questions. And sometimes if questions get asked in a different uh, order, then I see three of the same question because they're one because of the way that the A to J author interviews were done. So I actually take both of those original documents and I apply word styles to them so that I can jump around and figure mm -hmm. out. I apply word styles and then also I put internal links so I can see what I can do. You want me to show you what like what my questions look like? Because then I sure. gray out. Hope the to see it. So I um share. I mean, I don't know how helpful this is to people who um don't already have this kind of thing written, but um, I have, let's see, here's, oh, um, okay, so here is, um, this is the responding in, it's legal separation or divorce or dissolution, but you can see here, fill out the forms to respond to the complaint. See how many uh, forms, steps see how many uh, you know options there are for forms whereas um over here this is the final new action plan um let's see i think it says fill out forms fill out forms okay so here, fill out the forms you need. It's one step, and I'm going to put a bunch of conditions in it. So that so instead of having 178 different fill out the forms to respond, there's one. But um, what I tend to do is I go through these and I gray out. I pick the one that has the most common um, denominators, and then I pick that one, and then I add the little bits in. And then my questions are... Responding in divorce questions. Oh. Is this? Okay. So this is what the original, this is what almost the original um, questions document looks like. So you can see it's, um, there are various paths that pers a person can take. And some of these things are repeated about, so for example, they ask, if do you have children three or four times? So the first thing I do is I go through and I turn them into heading twos so I can navigate through the questions they have. And then I um, and then after I apply the headings, then I I use this document. This is a I had this is a template, and this is my own docx template where I have um, I have these various styles. And what I do is I take all the questions, I dump them in. So I've, paid, I've copied all the questions from the original questions, put it in here, apply the styles. And then I see that, in fact, there are things like if you don't want children, it, it, this children paternity thing, um, you can see there's a million questions here, whether you want a legal separation and you have kids or you have one legal separation, you have kids and you don't have a paternity, et cetera, et cetera. So what I do is when I go down there, I'll sort of, once the question is answered somewhere else, then I gray it out. And so eventually this will be, now this is, you know, the thing about this is this is um, taking documents that already exist and converting them. But that's the, that's how I go about it. 
Um, and this is also a really complex interview, right? I mean, it's 51 pages of questions. Yeah, and it, and actually, it's 51 pages, but I usually get it down to like a quarter. So it'll be, ultimately, it'd be 12 mm -hmm. or 13 pages. And then I stick the, so for example, I stick the logic, I, you know, a style for the logic. So if you come here from this path, this is what you do. And these are pieces of steps that go in there. So this is a more complicated interview. But even for the simpler ones, um, I just take styles. And the, and the reason I do that is because my substantive editor doesn't read um, YAML files, um, doesn't want to go through the YAML interview and check it. And she's more comfortable looking at a Word document. Hmm. And it, I think the thing is when I link, because I make the questions headings, I can link that it sort of allows her to go through the interview, not not, not in DocAssemble, but basically in Word. Um, and I put the conditions in there for myself because that helps me figure out, you know, that's that's how I keep track of it. Uh, and then the other thing I do is I, I, this is sort of a little bit like what Vivian's talking about. This is a, this is one I'm just, again, this is what I'm just starting, but I have a color code and I put my variables. Th these are the paths that you would take through the interview. So here's a variable, here are the possible answers. And if you answer that, then, then you go to the next variable, then you have the answers. This is a, I'm just starting this. And what I tend to do is have all these rows and then I move them down and move move all the rows around in the spreadsheet depending on the path. But the thing I, I like about this is this also enables me to write the tests in AL Kiln. So I already have the variables. I already have the values for the variables it, for, for every test. I can just, and then when I refer to Obviously, I don't, not obviously, but I don't test, you know, 152 possible paths, but I usually put once, once this spreadsheet is the draft is done and I start testing it, then I have a column of numbers and I can refer to my tests by row numbers. Um, and then I'll know what the scenario is. So I can say row such and such, and I can come back and check the spreadsheet. So that that's, I think that's that's how I do it anyway. Same. Does anybody else have a similar set of like how you organize interviews in a in anything? I'd be curious if you're willing to share. I'd I'd love to see other tools that people have developed to do this work. Yeah, I could uh I could share what I what I do. Oh, I'd love to see it, Toby. Thanks. Yeah, and just I'm Toby Fay. I work with uh Clinton and Jim at Lem Legal. Uh and we do all kinds of Project. So it's, you know, you're talking about like different roadmaps. We just haven't, you know, sometimes we have uh, a grant that we have to sort of build the whole project with the, with the clients. Sometimes, you know, we just try to show individual lawyers like forms as quickly as we can. Uh, and then other times we work with people and we just fix the fix existing interviews or, um, but what I do, like it, it sounds pretty similar. It's like making a list. Um, I like to try to, you know, just pull out all of the fields from a document. Hopefully, there's some easy way to do that, um, or, but, you know, or but use a regular expression and just pull if I have to I can go through and put brackets around whatever words are there and so I can just pull out pull out all the fields and with with the regular expression search and then I put that into Airtable um I've got a table for statements which is what I call them like just whatever I'm pulling out of this are you able to share it with us and share your screen yeah sure I'd love to see it I geek out on tools, so I want to, I want to see everybody's tools. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
things. But I don't know what actually I, I have as the best example. Now, Toby, when you say you pull out the fields from the document, presumably this is a document that already has fields. Is it a PDF that's already labeled or DocX that has fields in it already? Or do you go through it? I think Toby might have frozen. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious to know the answer, too. See if it comes back in a minute. Well, Toby's frozen. <laughs> Maybe somebody else can share what they're they're doing. I um I think I can stop that share, can't I? Here comes Emily. Yeah, and I could just say I I do not have as developed of a system as anyone has mentioned so far. Um uh as of yet for the beginning of a interview um we have like a a documentation like kind of an internal documentation page where we try to keep track of decisions and methods for doing things that are going to apply to other interviews um and ever there's like a very thorough checklist for the end of a project um for, for like the, the like sort of launch steps to make sure i remember all sort of all the things are set up the way they need to be um, and we do all the things we need to do at launch. Um, but yeah, I don't have my, don't have uh, a systematic process yet for sort of starting an interview. Um, how do you guys prevent like, or I mean, not prevent is the right word, but how do you like, how do you limit the scope and avoid feature creep or scope creep or whatever you want? You know, because like you can make, an interview as awesome as you can imagine. So how do you like keep put guardrails around what you're doing? So, um, you know, when you, when you give a demo and they're like, Oh, but I really wanted to do this. And that would require another, you know, 25 hours of work or how, how do you, how do you make sure that you can say no to that or to yourself mm -hmm. when you've decided how much better it could be for me, it's saying no to myself more than saying no to other people. I think reminding myself that it will be hours and hours and more hours of work than I think it will be. Because <laughs> uh, I'm like, sometimes it can be like, oh, that, that, oh, yeah, that, that would be super easy. And then it's not. What if you have a stakeholder that says, no, I think it really should do this? How do you, like, what do you, how do you set it up beforehand so that you have a way to say no to that? If anyone has, I mean, I, Caroline, I know you've managed a lot of this, these projects too. So yeah, I um, don't, but, um, but anyway. I've actually not had my experience, particularly at the court has not been that they want to do, they want it to do more. It's been, oh, it can do that. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> it's been really nice. I mean, and I have to say, sometimes I, I say, oh, Doc Assemble can do this. Why don't we just do it? And then it turns out it's the whole date there's a very complicated date, you know, you know, deadlines for when forms are due. And that mm -hmm. ended up being a very complicated feature. But at the same time, it's this balance, isn't it, between because the stuff that's easy for our target audience. I mean, if you're if you're doing forms for self-represented litigants, the stuff that's easy for them to do, there isn't a whole lot of point in us doing doc assemble interviews for them if they can just do it but the thing mm. the reason you know for me the philosophy behind it is we're trying to make the forms that are hard for people to do accessible and um you know so what i you know the things that could be better it's not it i say no to myself i have to let go a lot of it is the readability edits at this point you know we have mm. a deadline we have a budget we're way over due um, I mean, that's partly my fault, but it's also, I came in five years behind, you know, behind the game anyway. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think that's really what it is, is there's stuff that I think, and and letting go, you know, is to go back to David Colarosa's <laughs> MVP thing. <laughs> Most, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting minimum, at, I guess. Minimum yeah. valuable product, right? And you just think, yeah. 
So I, and I have started using GitHub more and more and more for um, creating issues and usually they're marked readability come back to. So, and I'm hoping that when we start doing forms, I can then, we, we, that forms aren't part of this project, just the action plan is. So I'm hoping that when we come back to do forms and integrate them into the action plan, that will give me the opportunity to do the readability edits. For for those of you who, um, I guess some of you, it sounds like maybe make this decision on yourself. But I'm curious, how do you how do you get like the final go no go decision? Who who gets that, and what does that process look like? Is it just like you've been working together the whole time, so it's more organic at the end, or is there sort of a presentation and you hand it over and ask them to try and break it and test it, or or have you done that sort of steps along the way so that it's more natural? I mean, I know, Caroline, you were trying to launch one of your big interviews, and it sounds like it was getting it launched was harder than you anticipated. Little inter it was a little interview, actually. It was a really teeny, oh, okay. teeny weeny interview. <laughs> <laughs> but we we didn't have a lot of the features that we needed in place for it. And but because because it needed sort of the ability to email the form, we finally, after two years, got the email feature working. You know, I mean, it, in a way, it was a catalyst that will allow our other interview, our first interview, it was a tiny one, but also that, um, the way that worked is we, uh, so the technical person who was working on that, the woman I'm hoping, I mean, she's part, we're part of a team. This is a, stock is building this team. Um, so she, there were two substantive people that she reported to, to check with, and she checked, I was her technical support. And um, when they signed off on it, and we had the email feature working, and we had the correct core email addresses in, so it was a peer process of testing. When that all went, was all done, then um, it's now live, but it's a link that the court staff send to people who call the court. So mm. it's not, it's not going to, I didn't know this, but it's not going to appear publicly. Um, it's a soft launch. <laughs> no, it's, it's launched. It's a hard launch, but the URL will not, there are only, there's a, there's a web page that says, if you want to do this, call the court. Right. And it's, and so the, so the court staff will send the interview to to users to to go through because otherwise people, gotcha. it's their way of screening getting these forms because they don't want all kinds of people to do it without understanding what they need to do so it's sort of a self a, not self-selected but the court selected target audience but that it's it was really the two substantive editors signed off on it hmm. what, what about i think matt you were going to say something about getting approval. Um, yeah, sure. Also, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Matt Newstead. I'm from Illinois Legal Aid Online. Um, oh, thanks. I, I forgot to force you to. <laughs> sure. That's good. Um, yeah. So we we have a variety of projects. Some of them we work closely with the partner stakeholders to through development, and they're more involved with saying, yes, this is good as it is. Um, or no, we want to do this other kind of thing. Um, and others, they just trust. I'm our... sorry, when you I don't when you say partner stakeholders, you mean like because my my understanding is Ileo is sort of like um, you do most of the online aspects of legal aid, so you might have I don't know Cook County Legal Services or something like. I don't know if that's a real thing, but and you would be building a form with them as your external partner. Well, it could be the like the Illinois courts were automating their forms. Mm -hmm. For the statewide audience, um, it could be for a, spe a specific, um, I guess, grant partner, like uh, the Resurrection Project we're working on. We're automating some oh, immigration okay. forms for them. Um, or if we have a grant, we have a TIG, and we're working with Land of Lincoln Legal Services, which is a legal services corporation funded legal aid organization in part of Illinois. And part of that is to automate certain forms. So we'll work um, with them. But um, going back in terms of dealing with scope creep real quick, mm -hmm. we've learned that we, 
before we do the work, we try to estimate what how long it'll take to do something and look try to look closely at the forms that they're asking to be automated and seeing what do we have that's similar, how much can we borrow, how much will have to be built from scratch, um, and then come back with an estimate. And then we learned it's really valuable to have check-ins and have them see where things are. And then if they say, oh, we wanted to do this instead or also do this, we can easily say, okay, we can build that. We think it's going to take this amount of time. Do you want to pay for that? Do you want to wait? Can you wait? Things like that. So that's managing expectations and being upfront and clear about what we're doing by when. That is something we've, we're still learning how to do that, but that's um, helped us uh, along the way. But in terms of who makes the decisions um, it's and who signs off on things, we, you know, we're fortunate at Vivian and I have a good amount of control where we can just decide which things we want to work on as long as we're respecting all of our different grant deadlines and organizational priorities and law changes and things like that. So it's a, um, it's, mm. it's a mix. I don't know if that's a clear answer, but it's, it's a number of factors. I guess I'm curious too, and this sort of seems, well, it's, it's related anyway, um, in the big picture, how, when you, when you are working with, an external partner, whether it's the courts or not, or even on internal projects, how often do you check in with those those other people? Whether it's your stakeholders or the the person who pulls gets to say yes or no, externally, internally, whatever. How how often do you check in with them? What's your cadence, meeting cadence? I guess. Yeah. So for us, it kind of depends on the project. There's several that we have a weekly check in uh, with them because we're that's how. We maybe have a short uh, deadline that we have to meet. And so we need to check in periodically to make sure we're not going off the rails on the project. And we also need information from them on mm -hmm. a regular basis. So we need to have those touch points. Um, some of them, like the, our the Illinois courts, we have a longstanding relationship with them. So we have a monthly check-in that we do, but we're also in touch with them several times a week by email or Slack or whatever. So um, yeah, it, it's like that. there have been some projects we worked on where we would meet just once every month or two. And I don't know, it's harder to make progress on those kinds of things without a more regular um, check-in. But mm -hmm. either way, the, the value, which I'm sure everyone knows this, What's really valuable is documenting what you cover in those checkpoints, what you say you're going to do, what other information you need to progress, things like that. That's really helped move things uh, along and helped keep things uh, on on track. We're uh, we've got we got some time left, but I'm I wanted to prompt you guys to throw something in the chat for me, which is kind of like, um, what is your what is your best tip and maybe there's a weird way to phrase it, but your worst tip for somebody who's embarking on their first interview project. And by best tip, like here's something you think that most people may not realize, something that you think you've figured out. And by worst tip, I mean, what's well, something you just sort of assume everybody knows, but let's not assume everybody knows it. Um, so drop those in the chat while we're while we're wrapping up here, because um, I'd, I'd love to share those too. Um, I was wondering too, um, well, I guess I'd love to hear from others too, what your meeting cadence looks like, or if you have one, um, how often do you check in with essentially everybody, but those who you might be at actually building an interview with? Um, I meet um, weekly with the, with the uh, contractor, or contractors at different times um and to check in about i don't know questions and things that we've come come across um and then every other week our director comes to that meeting so we can kind of check in about any bigger picture um stuff that's coming up everything else and your, your contractors hoc. also like a, they're coding interviews they're doing the hands-on work yeah yep. yeah okay but yeah everything else and the, kind of and so far where it need, just when it seems right. Yeah, and yeah, more usually more by email is is how we're communicating with the like people who are testing and uh, 
answering questions about the content of the interview okay. so far. Caroline, you've got, um, I think you now have somebody you're building interviews with, right? Don't you have a new? Yeah. You're still muted, but. Um... Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I mean, just that's, she's just d d done that. Yeah. And she's very technical. Um, mm -hmm. And, and sh her, she as a forms attorney. Um, my, I think my tips I started to put into chat are, I assume that people know how to use word styles. Because I think those are really <laughs> helpful. And that is a big mistake. But that's, my tip would be use styles. If yeah. this has, and this is as a communication tool with people who aren't comfortable reading the YAMLs, you know, or even, or even, or even forms. But the fortunate. I think it'd be difficult to navigate those, your organizational documents, your planning documents. It'd be impossible to navigate without being able to have that kind of an overview. Yeah, my boss says she kept it all in her head. And I thought, how on earth? I mean, she, they, <laughs> they, they, they used variables in A to J author and the variable names are very helpful and very clear. I mean, that, if, if she hadn't, if they, I mean, those, these Word documents have started off very well, but I don't know how they found their way around it um, because they'd be scrolling. I mean, literally these documents are like 120, 140 pages long. You know, so, so that that temp, those uh, planning documents you inherited those those. I inherited those, and then I applied yeah. styles to them. They had yeah. okay. They had highlighted them, but you can't search by highlight, and you can't navigate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can search by highlight, but if you highlight something in yellow and you highlight something else in blue, it's still highlighted. Word won't. You have to do a macro to search on different colors, yeah. and I, you know VBA mm -hmm. bloody blah thingy. So, um, I just figure out ways to apply styles and going forward we're not going to be using those <laughs> <laughs> oh what are you what are you switching to we're not using highlights we're using stop we're oh, oh, I see. Them gotcha. styles yeah gotcha i'll uh i'll share my favorite tip i guess practice um this is something i added to the roadmap page and which is the concept of a retrospective and those of you who have coding backgrounds probably already know what this is, but it's a, you know, we're, we're working on projects that are meant to be iterated on and improved over time. Um, and I really like the retrospective as a way for every time you get to, um, to launch or you, a new version, um, in a typical agile workflow, you know, you'd be, you'd be launching something every two weeks. I don't think any of us actually do it that way. Um, but at the end of every project, I like to stop and do a retrospective. And what I, what that is, is essentially you ask three questions. What went well that we should keep doing? What did not go well that we should stop doing? And what should we try going forward or try next time? And I really like that because it forces you to sort of stop and reflect and improve every time you do something. Um, so like with this, my summer students, I had a one-on-one -on -one retrospective meeting with each one of them. It's not long. Like I think those were all, five to 10 minute meetings. Um, this isn't meant to be a long searching, <laughs> you know, uh, process, but um, but it's a great way of just um, finding out what you might've missed or what assumptions you might've set aside and, and move past. That's my favorite tip for any kind of project. I like retrospectives a lot. Um, I think making yourself stop and look backwards is a really good practice. Um, Caroline says, um, for the kind of project you're working on, oh, using word styles, you just hit, hit send. Awesome. Documenting, as you ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're at the end of our hour. Thank you so much to all of you. I, um, I This was fun for me, at least. I, and I really appreciate you guys coming and participating and, and uh, sharing your experiences and knowledge. Um, oh, here, Matt and Emily have dropped a couple tips in there. Um, Matt says... Uh, when you're developing the interview roadmap, think about ways to group similar information, even if they it shows up in different places. Um, that'll minimize your focus and task switching and improve the user experience. Awesome. Um, he also says they rely on the standards as much as possible. Um, they can be homegrown, but um, sort of build your standards as you go to make things have a similar look and feel and polish. You know, I didn't even mention that, but absolutely. And I, you know, I came into the assembly line this year and there was already a style guide 
um, from the project and we're working on updating and refining that too. And everybody, every project kind of ends up with its own style guide as well. But when you guys are working on things, you build it over time. I love that. Um, I, I'm a big fan of style guides. I have, I have several just on the shelves behind me that I refer to more than you might think. Um, Emily says, document every decision and every little research project in a place where you can find it again because you'll quit, find, forget more quickly than you expect. That's great. And <laughs> yeah, so like I, when when we talk to students about this, I, I insist that they use GitHub issues for this, right? It's a great place to document questions, problems, and and resolution, right? Like what happened with it? And, and what I tell them is, um, look, you, present you and future you are not the same person with the same memories, right? You are going to forget why you decided not to include this part of the question. And so if you have addressed it, write it down, document it so that you can move forward. Because even, even if you're the one who looks at it in two years, you're not going to remember. Um, and it probably isn't going to be. In our case, it's probably not going to be you because we work on a school year basis. Um, but yeah, fantastic tip. Documentation is key. Thanks, everyone. I had a lot of fun. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Uh, maybe I'll come up with another way to do this. I really liked this format. So we'll see this up on YouTube. And if you think of any tips that you forgot to share, you can drop them in the comments there, I guess. And uh, thanks, everyone. We'll see you next. Well, I'll see you guys on Monday. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thank you.